from around the globe, it's theCUBE. Presenting Active DQ, Intelligent Automation for Data Quality. Brought to you by IO Tahoe. Welcome to the sixth episode of the IO Tahoe Data Automation Series on theCUBE. We're going to start off with a segment on how to accelerate the adoption of Snowflake with Glenn Grossman, who's the Enterprise Account Executive from Snowflake, and Youssef Khan, the Head of Data Services from IO Tahoe. Gentlemen, welcome. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, Dave. <laughs> good to see you, Dave. Indeed, good to see you. Okay, Glenn, uh, let's start with you. I mean, theCUBE hosted the, the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit in November, and we heard from customers going from, love the tagline, zero to Snowflake, you know, 90 minutes, very quickly. And of course you want to make it simple and attractive for enterprises to move data and analytics into the Snowflake platform. But help us understand, once the data is there, how is Snowflake helping to achieve savings compared to the, <laughs> the data lake? Absolutely, Dave, it's a great question. You know, it starts off first with the notion and uh, kind of we coined it in the industry, our t-shirt size pricing. You know, you don't necessarily always need the performance of a, a high-end sports car when you're just trying to go get some groceries and drive down the street 20 miles an hour. The t-shirt the pricing really aligns to depending on what your operational workload is to support the business and the value that you need from that business. Not every day do you need data. Every second of the moment might be once a day, once a week. And through that t-shirt size pricing, we can align uh, for the performance according to what the environmental needs of the business, what those drivers are, the key performance indicators to drive that insight to make better decisions. It allows us to control that cost. So to my point, not always do you need the performance of a Ferrari. Maybe you need the performance and gas mileage of, of the Honda Civic, if you would, just to get and deliver the value of the business, but knowing that you have that entire performance landscape at a moment's notice. And that's really what what allows us to hold and uh, get away from how much is it going to cost me in a data lake type of environment. Got it, yeah, thank you for that. Youssef, where does IO Tahoe fit into this equation? I mean, what's, what's, what's unique about the approach that you're taking toward this notion of mobilizing data on Snowflake? Well, Dave, in the first instance, we profile the data itself at the data level. So not just at the level of, of metadata, and we do that wherever that data lives. So it could be structured data, could be semi-structured data, could be unstructured data, and that data could be on-premise, uh, it could be in the cloud, uh, or it could be on some kind of SaaS platform. Um, and so we profile this data at the source system that is feeding Snowflake, within Snowflake itself, within the end applications and the reports that the Snowflake environment is serving. So what we've done here uh, is take our machine learning discovery technology and make Snowflake itself the repository for knowledge and insights on data. And this is pretty unique. Uh, you know, automation in, in the form of RPA is being applied to the data both before, after, and within Snowflake. And so the ultimate outcome is that business users can have a much greater degree of confidence that the data they're using can be trusted. Um, the other thing we do, uh, which is unique is uh, employ data RPA to proactively detect and recommend fixes to data quality. So that removes the manual time and effort and cost it takes to fix those data quality issues uh, if they're left unchecked and untouched. So that's key, two things there, the, the trust, nobody's going to use the data if it's not trusted, but also context. If you think about it, we've contextualized our operational systems, but not our analytic systems. So this is a big step forward. Glenn, I, I wonder if you could tell us how customers are managing data quality when they migrate to Snowflake, because there's a lot of baggage in, in traditional data warehouses and data lakes and, and data hubs. Maybe you could talk about why this is a challenge for customers and, and like, for instance, can you proactively address some of those challenges that customers face? Yeah, we certainly can, Dave. You know, data quality, legacy data sources are always inherent with DQ issues. Uh, whether it's been master data management and data stewardship programs over the last really almost two decades right now, you do have systemic data issues, you have silo data, you have information, operational data stores, data marts. It became a hodgepodge. When organizations are starting their journey to migrate to the cloud, 
you know, one of the things that we're first doing is that inspection of data. Um, you know, first and foremost, even looking to retire legacy data sources that aren't even used across the enterprise, but because they were part of the systemic long running operational on-premise technology, it stayed there. When we start to, you know, look at data pipelines as we onboard a customer, you know, we want to do that error. We want to do QA and quality assurance so that we can, and our ultimate goal, eliminate the garbage in, garbage out scenarios that we've been plagued with really over the last 40, 50 years of just data in, in general. So we have to take an inspection where traditionally it was ETL. Now in the world of Snowflake, it's really ELT. We're extracting, we're loading, we're inspecting, then we're transforming out to the business so that these routines could be done once and again, give great business value back to making decisions around the data instead of spending all this long time always re-architecting the data pipeline to serve the business. Got it, Th thank you, Glenn. Now, now Yusuf, of course, Snowflake's renowned for, I mean, customers tell me all the time, it's so easy, it's so easy to spin up a data warehouse. Uh, I, I, it helps with my security. Again, it simplifies everything. But so, you know, getting started is one thing, but then adoption is also a key. So I'm interested in the role that, that IO Tahoe plays in accelerating adoption for new customers. Absolutely, uh, Dave. I mean, as, as Glenn said, you know, every every migration to Snowflake is going to have a business case, um, uh, and that is going to be uh, partly about reducing spend in legacy IT servers, storage, licenses, support, all those good things um, that CIOs want to be able to, to turn off entirely, ultimately. Um, and what IOTAHO does is help discover all the legacy undocumented silos uh, that have been built up, as Glenn says, on the data estate um, across a period of time, uh, build intelligence around those silos and help reduce those legacy costs sooner by accelerating that, that whole process. Because obviously the quicker that IT um, and CDOs can turn off legacy uh, data sources, the more funding and resources going to be available to them to manage the new uh, Snowflake-based data estate on, on the cloud. And so turning off the old, building the new, go hand in hand to make sure those, those numbers stack up, uh, the program is delivered, uh, and the benefits are delivered. Uh, and so what we're, we're doing here with IOTAHO is improving the customer's ROI by accelerating their ability to adopt Snowflake. Great, and, and I mean, I we're talking a lot about data quality here, but in a lot of ways, that's table stake. Like I said, if you don't trust the data, nobody's going to use it. And Glenn, I mean, I look at Snowflake and I see of obviously the ease of use, the simplicity, you guys are nailing that. The data sharing capabilities, I think are really exciting uh, because you know everybody talks about sharing data, uh, but then we talk about data as an asset. Everybody wants to hide, hide and hold it. And so sharing is, is, is something that I see as a paradigm shift and you guys are enabling that. Uh, so what are the things beyond data quality that are notable that, that customers are excited about that maybe you're excited about? Dave, I think you just uh, cleared it out. It's it's this massive data sharing uh, play, part of the data cloud platform. Uh, you know, just as of last year, we had a little over about hundred people, uh, hundred vendors. You know, in our data marketplace, that number today is well over four hundred and fifty, and it is all about democratizing and sharing data in a world that is no longer held back by FTPs and CSVs and then the you know organization having to take that data and ingest it into their systems. You're a Snowflake customer, want to subscribe to an SMP data source as an example, go subscribe it to it. It's in your account. There was no data engineering. There was no physical lift of data. And that becomes the most important thing when we talk about getting broader insights, data quality, well, the data's already been inspected from your vendor. It's just available in your account. It's obviously a very simplistic thing to describe behind the scenes is what you know our founders have created to make it very, very easy for us to democratize not only internal with private sharing of data, but this notion of marketplace and sharing across your customers. Um, marketplace is certainly on the top of all of my customers' minds and probably some other areas that might have heard out of our recent cloud summit is the introduction of Snowpark and being able to do where all this data is going towards is am I in an AL, you know, along with our partners at IO Tahoe and RPA automation is 
what do we do with all this data? How do we put the algorithms and targets? Now we'll be able to run in the future R and Python scripts and Java libraries directly inside Snowflake, which allows you to even accelerate even faster you know, which people found traditionally when we started off eight years ago, just as a data warehousing platform. Yeah, I think we're in the cusp of just a new way of thinking about data. I mean, obviously simplicity is a starting point, but, but data by its very nature is decentralized. You talk about democratizing data. I like this idea of the global mesh. I mean, it's a very powerful concept. And again, it's, it's early days, but a you know, key part of this is, is, is automation and, and trust. Yusef, you've worked with Snowflake, and you're bringing active DQ to the market. What are customers telling you so far? Well, Dave, I mean, the, the feedback so far has been great, which, which is brilliant. So, I mean, firstly, there's a point about speed and, and acceleration. Um, so that's speed to insight, really. So where you have inherent data quality issues, uh, whether that's with data that was on premise uh, and being brought into Snowflake or on Snowflake itself, we're able to show the customer results uh, and help them understand their data quality better within day one, which is, which is a fantastic acceleration. Um, related to that, there's the cost and effort to get that insight is it's a massive productivity gain versus where you're seeing customers who've been struggling sometimes to remediate uh, legacy data and legacy decisions that they've made over the past couple of decades. So that, that cost uh, and effort is much lower than it would otherwise have been. Um, Thirdly, there's, there's confidence and trust. So you can see CDOs and CIOs have got demonstrable results uh, that they've been able to improve data quality across a whole bunch of use cases for business users in marketing and customer services for commercial teams, for financial teams. So there's that, that very quick kind of growth uh, in confidence and credibility um, as the projects get moving. And then finally, I mean, really, all the use cases for for Snowflake depend on data quality, really, whether it's data science uh, uh, and, and the kind of snowpark applications that Glenn has talked about. All those use cases work better um, when we're able to accelerate the ROI for our joint customers by, by very quickly pushing out these data quality um, insights. Um, and I think one of the, one of the things that, that the Snowflake have, have recognized is that in order for CIOs to really adopt enterprise-wide, um, it's also as well as the great technology that Snowflake offers, it's about cleaning up that legacy data estate, freeing up the budget for CIOs to spend it on, on the new modern data estate that, that lets them mobilize their data with Snowflake. So you're seeing this kind of pro progression We're simplifying the, the, the analytics from a tech perspective. You bring in federated governance, which, which brings more trust. Then, then you bring in the automation of the data quality piece, which is fundamental. And now you can really start to, as you guys were saying, democratize and scale uh, and share data. Very powerful guys. Thanks so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate your time. Dave, thank, thank you. you. We appreciate it as well. Tired of performing manual data quality reviews? dealing with data incidents and spending valuable time on manual data remediation? Re-establish trust in your data with IOTAHO's Data RPA technology. AI-driven digital workers packaged into a seamless user experience connect directly to all your data sources. They automate repetitive laborious tasks like data discovery, data cataloging, data mapping, data lineage, data enrichment, data deduplication, and data remediation. A specialized ActiveDQ digital worker provides continuous automated data quality assessments for data producers powered by machine learning to ensure data is fit for consumption by data consumers on your Snowflake data cloud. ActiveDQ alerts data producers with data anomalies detected, providing data consumers with continuous reporting of trends and analysis across your data quality KPIs. ActiveDQ then proactively generates recommendations for auto remediation to accelerate data quality improvements and reduce the cost and business impact of poor quality data. Ready to accelerate your data modernization journey to Snowflake's data cloud? Start with our low cost, minimal effort data mobilization for Snowflake package and achieve key cloud migration and data quality improvement milestones in hours. Download the brief to learn more and book time with an IOTAHO engineer 
now. Okay, now we're going to look at the role automation plays in mobilizing your data on Snowflake. Let's welcome in Duncan Turnbull, who's partner sales engineer at Snowflake, and AJ Vahora is back CEO of IO Tahoe. He's going to share his insight. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, David. Good to be back. Yeah, it's great to have you back, AJ. Uh, and it's really good to see IO Tahoe expanding the ecosystem. So important uh, now, of course, bringing Snowflake in. It looks like you're really starting to build momentum. I mean, there's progress that we've seen every month, month by month over the past 12, 14 months. Your seed investors, they got to be happy. They are, they're, they're happy and they can see that uh, we're running into a nice phase of expansion here, new customers signing up and you know, we're ready to go out and raise that next round of funding. I think, um, maybe think of us like Snowflake five years ago. So we're definitely on track with that. A um, lot of interest from investors and um, we're really now trying to focus in on those investors that can partner with us that understand AI, data and, and automation. Well, so personally, I mean, you've managed a number of early stage VC funds, I think four of them. Uh, you've taken several comp uh, software companies through many funding rounds and growth and all the way to exit. So you know how it works. You got to get product market fit. You know, you got to make sure you get your KPIs right and you got to hire yep. the right salespeople. But, but what's different this time around? Uh, well, you know, the fundamentals that you mentioned, those, those don't ever change. And um, what we can see, what I can see that's different, that's shifted uh, this time around is three things. One, in that there used to be this kind of choice of do we go open source or do we go proprietary? Um, now that has turned into um, a nice hybrid model where we've really keyed into, um, you know, Red Hat doing something similar with CentOS. And the idea here is that there is a core capability, a technology that underpins um, a platform but it's the ability to then build an ecosystem around that made up of a community. And that community may include customers, uh, technology partners, other tech vendors, and enabling the platform adoption so that all of those folks in that community can build and contribute um, while still maintaining the core architecture and platform integrity uh, at the core of it. And, that's one thing that's changed. We're seeing a lot of that type of software company um, emerge into that model, which is different from five years ago. Um, and then leveraging the cloud, um, every cloud, Snowflake Cloud being one of them here, in order to make use of what customers uh, and customers in enterprise software are moving towards. Uh, every CIO is now in some configuration of a hybrid um, IT estate, whether that is cloud, multi-cloud, on-prem, that's just the reality. The, the other piece is in dealing with the CIO's legacy. So the past 15, 20 years, they have purchased many different platforms, technologies, and some of those are still established and, and still functional. So how do you um, enable that CIO to make a purchase while still preserving, and in some cases, building on and extending the the legacy um, mature technologies that they've invested their people's time in training and uh, financial investment into. Yeah, and of course, you know, solving a problem, customer pain point uh, with technology that uh, that never goes out of fashion. No, that that never changes. You have to focus like a laser on that, and and of course. Um... Speaking of companies who are focused on like solving problems, Duncan Turnbull from Snowflake, you guys have really done a great job and really brilliantly addressing pain points, particularly around data warehousing. You've simplified that, you're providing this new capability around data sharing, uh, really you know, quite amazing. Um, Duncan, AJ you know, talks about data quality and customer pain points uh, in, in enterprise IT. Why has data quality been such a problem historically? Sure, so one of the biggest challenges that's really affected that in the past is that because to address everyone's need for using data, 
they've evolved all these kinds of different places to store it, all these different silos or data marts or all this kind of proliferation of places where data lives. And all of those end up with slightly different schedules for bringing data in and out. They end up with slightly different rules for transforming that data and formatting it and getting it ready and slightly different quality checks for making use of it. And this then becomes like a, a big problem in that these different teams are then going to have slightly different or even radically different <laughs> answers to the same kinds of questions, which makes it very hard for teams to work together uh, on their different data problems that exist inside the business, depending on which of these silos they end up looking at. And what you can do if you have a single kind of scalable uh, system for putting all of your data into it, you can kind of sidestep a lot of this complexity and you can address the, the data quality issues in a, in a, single, in a single way. Now, of course, we're seeing this huge trend in the market towards uh, robotic process automation, RPA. That adoption is accelerating. Uh, you see in you know, UiPaths, uh, IPO, you know, 35 plus billion dollars uh, uh, valuation, you know, snowflake like numbers, nice comps there for sure. Uh, AJ, you've coined the phrase data RPA. What is that in simple terms? Yeah, I mean, it was born out of uh, seeing how in our ecosystem across that community, developers and customers, uh, general business users were wanting to adopt and deploy uh, Tahoe's technology. And we could see that, um, I mean, it's not marketing RPA, we're not trying to automate that piece, but wherever there is a process that was tied into some form of a manual overhead with handovers and so on. Um, that process is something that we're able to automate with, with our entire host technology. And, and the employment of AI and machine learning technology specifically to those data processes, almost as a precursor to getting into financial automation, that, um, that's really where we're seeing the momentum pick up, especially in the last six months. And we've kept it really simple with Snowflake. We kind of stepped back and said, well, you know, the resource that uh, Snowflake can leverage here is, is the metadata. So how could we turn Snowflake into that repository of being the data catalog? And, and by the way, if you're a CIO looking to purchase a data catalog tool, stop, there's no need to. Um, working with Snowflake will enable that intelligence to be gathered automatically and to be put to use within Snowflake. So reducing that manual effort and, and putting that data to work. And, um, and that's where we've you know, packaged this with our AI machine learning specific to those data tasks. And, and it made sense. That's what's resonated with, with our customers. You know, what's interesting here, just a quick aside is, you know, I've been watching mm -hmm. Snowflake now for a while and, and you know, you, of course the, 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 the competitors come out and they'll maybe criticize, well, they don't have this feature, they don't have that feature. And, and Snowflake seems to have an answer. And, and the answer oftentimes is, well, it's the ecosystem. Ecosystem is going to bring that because we have a platform that's so easy to work with. So, the, so I'm interested, Duncan, in what kind of collaborations you are enabling with high quality data and of course, you know, your data sharing capability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the ability to work on, on data sets isn't just limited to inside the business itself or even between different business units that we were kind of discussing maybe with those silos before. When looking at this idea of collaboration, we have these challenges where we want to be able to exploit data to the greatest degree possible, but we need to maintain the security, the safety, the privacy and governance of that data, it could be quite valuable, it could be quite personal, depending on the application involved. One of these novel applications that we see between organizations of data sharing is this idea of data clean rooms. And these data clean rooms are safe collaborative spaces, which allow multiple companies or even divisions inside a company where they have particular uh, privacy requirements to bring two or more data sets together for analysis, but without having to actually share the whole unprotected data set with each other. And this lets you to, you know, when you do this inside Snowflake, you can collaborate using standard tool sets. You can use all of our SQL ecosystem. You can use all of the data science ecosystem that works with Snowflake. You can use all of the BI ecosystem that works with Snowflake, but you can do that in a way that keeps the confidentiality that needs to be preserved inside the data intact. 
And you can only really do these kinds of uh, collaborations, especially cross organizations, but even in, inside large enterprises, when you have good, reliable data to work with. Otherwise, your, your analysis just isn't going to really work properly. Uh, a good example of this is one of our large gaming uh, customers who's an advertiser. They were able to build targeting ads to acquire customers and measure the campaign impact and revenue, but they were able to keep their data safe and secure while doing that, while working with their advertising partners. Uh, the business impact of that was they were able to get a lift of 20 to 25% in campaign effectiveness through better targeting and actually a, a pull through into that of a reduction in customer acquisition costs because they just didn't have to spend as much on the forms of media that weren't working for them. So AJ, I wonder, I mean, you, you know, with, with the way public policy is shaping out, you know, obviously GDPR mm -hmm. started it in the States, you know, California Consumer Privacy Act, and people are sort of taking the best of those and, 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 and there's a lot of differentiation, but what are you seeing just in terms of, you know, governments really driving this, this move to privacy? Yeah, um, government, public sector, we're seeing uh, a huge, wake up an activity in uh, across the whole piece there. Um, part of it has been data privacy. Um, the other part of it is being more joined up and more uh, digital rather than paper or form based. Uh, we've all got stories of waiting in line, holding a form, taking that form to the front of the, the line and handing it over at a desk. You know, government and public sector is really looking to transform their services into being online digital self-service. Um, and that whole shift is then driving the need to um, emulate a lot of what the commercial sector is doing um, to automate their processes and to unlock the data from silos to put through into those, uh, those processes. Um, you know, another thing that I can say about this is the the need for data quality, is, as uh, Duncan mentions, underpins all of these processes, government, pharmaceuticals, utilities, banking, insurance, the, the ability for a chief marketing officer to drive a, a loyalty campaign, the, the ability for a CFO to reconcile accounts at the end of the month to do a, a, a quick, accurate financial close. Um, also the, the ability of uh, customer operations to make sure that the customer has the right details about themselves in the right uh, application that they can sell serve from. All of that is underpinned by data and is effective or not based on the quality of that data. So whilst we're mobilizing data to the Snowflake cloud, the ability to then drive analytics, prediction, business processes off that cloud um, succeeds or fails on the quality of that data. I mean, and you know, I would say, I mean, it really is table stakes. If you don't trust the data, you're not going to use the data. The problem is it always takes so long to get to the data quality. There's all these endless debates about it. So we've been doing a, a fair amount of work and thinking around this idea of you know, decentralized data. Data by its very nature is decentralized, but the fault domains of traditional big data is that everything is just monolithic and the organization's monolithic, the technology's monolithic, the roles are very you know, hyper-specialized. And so you're hearing a lot more these days about this notion of a data fabric or what Jamak Dagani calls a data mesh. Uh, and we've kind of been leaning into that and, and the ability to, to connect various data capabilities, whether it's a data warehouse or a data hub or a data lake, that those assets are discoverable, they're shareable through APIs and they're governed on a federated basis. And you're using now bringing in a machine intelligence to improve data quality. You know, I, I wonder Duncan, if you could talk a little bit about Snowflake's approach to this topic. Sure, so I'd say that, you know, making use of all of your data is the, the key kind of driver behind these ideas of data meshes or data fabrics. And the idea is that you want to bring together not just your kind of strategic data, but also your legacy data and everything that you have inside the enterprise. I think I'd also like to kind of expand upon what a lot of people view as all of the data. 
And I think that a lot of people kind of miss that there's this whole other world of data that they could be having access to, which is things like data from their business partners, their customers, their suppliers, uh, and even stuff that's you know more in the public domain, whether that's you know demographic data or geographic or all these kinds of other types of, of data sources. And what I'd say to, to that to some extent is that the data cloud really facilitates the ability to share and gain access to this both kind of uh, between organizations, inside organizations, and you don't have to you know, make lots of copies of the data and kind of worry about the storage and this federated um, you know, idea of governance and all these things that's quite complex to kind of manage. This, uh, you know, the Snowflake approach really enables you to share data with your ecosystem or the world without any latency, with full control over what's shared, without having to introduce new complexities or having complex interactions with APIs or software integration. The simple approach that we provide allows a relentless focus on creating the right data product to meet the challenges facing your business today. So AJ, the key here is, to, to, Duncan's talking about it, in my mind anyway, my key takeaway is to mm -hmm. simplicity. If you can take the complexity out of the equation, you know, you're going to get more adoption. It really is that simple. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that whole journey, maybe five, six years ago, the adoption of data lakes was, was a stepping stone. Uh, however, the Achilles heel there was, you know, the complexity that it shifted towards consuming that data from a data lake where there were many, many sets of data um, to, to be able to curate and to, um, to consume. Uh, whereas actually, you know, the simplicity of being able to go to the data that you need to do your role, whether you're in tax compliance or in customer services is is key. And, you know, listen, for Snowflake via Taho, one thing we know for sure is that our customers are super smart and they're very capable, they're, they're data savvy and they'll want to use whichever tool and embrace whichever um, cloud platform that is going to reduce the barriers to um, solving what's complex about that data, simplifying that and using um, good old fashioned SQL um, to access data and to build products from it to exploit that data. So um, simplicity is is key to it to allow people to 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 make use of that data and, and CIOs recognize that. So Duncan, the, the cloud obviously brought in this notion of DevOps um, and new methodologies and things like agile that brought that's brought in the notion of data ops, which is a very hot topic right now. Um, Basically, DevOps applies to, to data, but, but how do you, how does Snowflake think about this? How do you facilitate that methodology? Yeah, so I'd, I'd agree with you absolutely that data ops takes these ideas of agile development, of agile delivery, and of the, the kind of DevOps world that we've seen just rise and rise, and it applies them to the, the data pipeline, which is somewhere where it kind of traditionally hasn't happened. And it's the same kinds of messages as we see in the development world. It's about delivering faster development, having better repeatability, and really getting towards that dream of the data-driven enterprise, you know, where you can answer people's data questions, they can make better business decisions. And we have some really great architectural advantages that allow us to do things like allow cloning of data sets without having to copy them, allows us to do things like time travel so we can see what, what data looked like at some point in the past. And this lets you kind of set up uh, both your own kind of little data playpen as a clone without really having to copy all of that data, so it's quick and easy. And you can also, again, with our separation of storage and compute, you can provision your own virtual warehouse for dev usage, so you're not interfering with anything to do with uh, people's production usage of this data. So the, these ideas, this scalability, it just makes it easy to make changes, test them, see what the effect of those changes are. And we've actually seen this, you were talking a lot about partner ecosystems earlier, uh, the partner ecosystem has taken these ideas that are inside Snowflake and they've extended them, they've integrated them with uh, DevOps and data ops tooling. So things like version control in Git and infrastructure automation and things like Terraform. And they've kind of built that out into more of a, a data ops product that, that you, can, you can make use of. So we can see there's a, a huge impact of, of these ideas coming into the data world. We think we're really well placed to take advantage of them. The partner ecosystem has doing, been doing a great job of doing that. And it really allows us to kind of change that operating model for data so that we don't have as much emphasis on like hierarchy and change windows and all these kinds of things that are maybe viewed as a lot fashioned. And we've kind of taken this shift from this batch data integration into, you know, 
streaming continuous data pipelines in the cloud. And this kind of gets you away from like a once a week or once a month change window if you're really unlucky to you know pushing changes uh, in a much more rapid fashion as the, the needs of the business change. I mean, those hierarchical organizational structures, uh, when we apply those to big data, that's what it actually creates the silos. So if you're going to be a silo buster, which AJ, I look at you guys as silo busters, you've got to put data in the hands of the domain experts, the business people. They know what data yeah. they want. If they have to go through and beg and borrow for new data sets, et cetera. And so that's where automation becomes so key. And frankly, the technology should be an implementation detail, not the dictating factor. I, I wonder if you could comment on this. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, making the, the technologies more accessible to the general business users or those specialist business teams, that, um, that's the key to unlocking this. And it's interesting to see as, as people move from organization to organization, where they've had those experiences operating in a hierarchical sense, they want to break free from that. And, um, or have been exposed to um, automation, continuous workflows, um, change is continuous in IT, it's continuous in business, the market's continuously changing. So having that flow across the organization of work using key components such as GitHub and similar tools to drive process, Terraform to build in um, code into the process and, and automation. And with Itaho, leveraging all the metadata from across those fragmented sources is, is, is good to see how those things are coming together and watching people move from organization to organization say, hey, okay, I've got a new start. I've got my first hundred days to impress my, my new manager. Uh, what kind of an impact can I um, bring to this? And quite often we're seeing that as, you know, let me take away the good learnings from how to do it or how not to do it from my previous role. And this is an opportunity for me to, to bring in automation. And I'll give you an example, David, you know, recently started working with a, a client in financial services, who's an asset manager, uh, managing financial assets that have grown over the course of the last 10 years through M and A. And each of those acquisitions have brought with it technical debt, its own set of data, they have multiple CRM systems now, multiple databases, multiple bespoke in-house created applications. And when the new CIO came in and had a look at this, he thought, well, you know, yes, I want to mobilize my data. Yes, I need to modernize my data state because my CEO is now looking at these crypto assets that are on the horizon and the new funds that are emerging that are around digital assets and, and crypto assets. But in order to get to that, where absolutely data un underpins that and is the core asset, um, cleaning up that, that legacy situation, mobilizing the relevant data into the Snowflake Cloud platform um, is where we're giving time back. You know, that is now taking a few weeks, whereas that transition to mobilize that data, start with that, that new clean slate to build upon a new business as a, a digital crypto asset manager, as well as the, the legacy traditional financial assets, bonds, stocks, um, fixed income assets, you name it, uh, is where we're starting to see a lot of innovation. Now, tons of innovation. I love the crypto examples, the NFTs are exploding and you know, but let's face it, traditional banks are getting dis disrupted. Uh, and so I also love this notion of data RPA, I, especially because AJ, I've done a lot of work in the RPA space. And, and I, what, I, okay. what, what I would observe is that the, the early days of RPA, I call it paving the cow path, taking existing processes, you know, applying scripts, get, letting software robots, you, you know, do its thing. And that was good because it reduced, you know, mundane tasks, but really where it's evolved is a much broader automation agenda. People are discovering new, new ways to, to completely transform their, their processes. And I see uh, a, a similar uh, analogy for data, the data operating model. So I wonder, I wonder mm. what you think about that and how a customer really gets started bringing this to their 
ecosystem, their data life cycles? Sure. Yeah. Step, step one is, is always the same. It's figuring out for the CIO, the chief data officer, uh, what, what data do I have? And, and that's um, increasingly something that they want to automate. So we can help them there and, and do that automated data discovery, whether that is documents in the file share, uh, backup archive in a relational data store, in a mainframe, really quickly hydrating that and, and bringing that intelligence to the forefront of, of what do I have? And then it's the next step of, well, okay, now I want to continually monitor and curate that intelligence with the, the platform that I've chosen, let's say Snowflake, um, in order such that I can then build applications on top of that platform to serve my, my internal and external customer needs. And the automation around classifying data, reconciliation across different fragmented data silos, building that in those insights into Snowflake. Um, as you'll see a little later on, where we're talking about data quality, active DQ, allowing us to reconcile data from different sources, as well as look at the integrity of that data, um, to then go on to remediation. You know, I, I want to um, harness and leverage um, techniques around traditional RPA, um, but to get to that, stage I need to fix the data so remediating publishing the data in Snowflake uh, allowing analysis to be formed performed in Snowflake th those are the key steps that we see and just shrinking that timeline into weeks giving the organization that time back means they're spending more time on their customer and, and solving their customers problem which is where we want them to be well, I think this is the brilliance of Snowflake, actually, you know, Duncan, I've talked mm -hmm. to about Benoit Dajavia about this and, and your, your other co-founders and, and it's really that focus on simplicity. So, I mean, that's, you, you picked a good company to join, in my opinion. So, um, <laughs> I, I, I wonder, uh, AJ, if you could, you know, talk about some of the industry sectors that are gain, going to gain the most from, from data RPA. I mean, a traditional RPA, if I can use that term, you know, a lot of it was back office, a lot of, you know, financial. What are the practical applications where data RPA is going to impact, you know, businesses and, and the outcomes that we can expect? Yes, yeah, so, so our drive is is really to, to make that um, business general users experience of RPA simpler and, and using no code to do that. Uh, where they've also chosen Snowflake to build their, their cloud platform. They've got the combination then of using uh, relatively simple script, scripting techniques such as SQL uh, with our no-code approach. And the, the answer to your question is whichever sector is looking to mobilize their data, um, it seems like a, a cop-out. But to, to give you some specific examples, David, um, you know, in banking, where our, our customers are looking to modernize their banking systems and enable better customer experience through through applications and digital apps. That's where we're we're seeing a lot of traction uh, in this approach to to play RPA to data. Um, healthcare, where there is a huge amount of work to do to standardize data sets across providers, payers, patients, uh, and it's an ongoing um, process there. But for retail, um, helping to to build that immersive customer experience. So recommending next best actions, um, providing an experience that is going to drive loyalty and retention. That's that's dependent on understanding what that customer's needs, intent are, being able to provide them with the content or the offer at that point in time, all, all data dependent. Utilities is another one, great overlap there with, with Snowflake, where you know, helping utilities, telecoms, energy, water providers to build services on their data. And this is where the ecosystem just continues to, to expand. If we're, if we're helping our customers turn their data into services for, for their ecosystem, that's, that's exciting. And nowhere more so exciting than insurance, which, I always used to um, think back to 
uh, when insurance used to be very dull and mon mundane. Actually, that's where we're seeing uh, huge amounts of innovation to create new flexible products that are priced you know, to the day, to the, the situation, and, and risk models being adaptive when the data changes uh, on, on events or circumstances. So across all those sectors that they're all mobilizing their data, they're all moving in some way or, or short form to a, a multi-cloud um, setup with their IT. And I think with, with Snowflake and with our Tahoe, being able to accelerate that and uh, make that journey simple and less complex is, uh, is why we've found such a good partner here. All right, thanks for that. And, and thank you guys both. We got to leave it there. Uh, really appreciate Duncan, you coming on. And, and AJ, best of luck with the fundraising. We'll keep you posted. Thanks, David. All right, great. Okay, now let's take a look at a short video that's going to help you understand how to reduce the steps around your data ops. Let's watch. With legacy traditional data catalog software, it is commonly known that there are five steps to completing an enterprise data catalog. These steps are, number one, interviewing stakeholders again and again to obtain context and understand how data is consumed. Number two, manually creating the catalog by personally inspecting and finding and logging data sets, where they're stored and how they are consumed. Number three, manually organizing and reorganizing categorization, classification, and usage of each data element. Number four, connecting the dots by manually linking data elements with each other to show relationships and producing a business glossary of terms and governance policies that the organization should adhere to. Then comes the task of wrangling every data consumer together under these rules, training them on these policies and ensuring quality by repeatedly manually re-inspecting and checking data sources. The obvious problem with these steps is they do not serve an enterprise scale. Imagine thousands and thousands of data stores that have to be combed through and then cross-referenced with dozens of employees working across different departments, often remotely and all manually. This leads to not only that, but you have more data coming through the pipeline all the time and constant changes to business systems. So most data professionals find themselves drowning in a proliferation of data with no feasible way to keep up with the task of data governance. Traditional data catalogues exacerbate these challenges by attempting to scale up resources with more people, implement an operating model for data governance that can only scale with manual effort and require expensive implementation for which there is no benefits realization for at least 12 months. Adoption by business users is slow, time consuming and difficult to coordinate as many business users do not want to take on the manual effort. Naturally, most of their time has to be allocated to their primary role. This means high labor costs persist even after implementation. Even when you bring in external consultants to your team, there is no time for business users to attend meetings, manage the project and participate in adoption of the manual operating model. So how are businesses supposed to have the ability to make agile data-driven decisions and achieve data modernization if their data governance operating model is manual and every step is managed as a waterfall plan? Turn five steps into one step with the IOTIO platform. Get ahead by automating discovery, cataloging, mapping, enrichment, lineage, and data quality assessment in one go. Data RPA built on advanced algorithms, machine learning, and AI enables our digital workers to perform all five of the repetitive traditional manual steps so you don't have to. Get insights in hours, achieve results in days, and complete projects accurately with less manual overhead. Generate a holistic view of data across all your system silos with a single version of the truth that you can trust. See what IOTAHO can do for your organization and sign up for our minimal cost, commitment-free data health check. Let us run our automated data discovery on key unmapped data silos and sources to give you a clear understanding of what's in your environment. Book time with an IOTAHO engineer now.
Are you ready to see Active DQ on Snowflake in action? Let's get into the show and tell and do the demo. With me are TG Matthew, the data solutions engineer at IO Tahoe. Also joining us is Patrick Zymet, data solutions engineer at IO Tahoe, and Senthil Nitin Karapaya, who's the head of production engineering at IO Tahoe. Patrick, over to you. Let's see it. Hey, Dave, thanks so much. Yeah, we've seen a huge increase in the number of organizations interested in the Snowflake implementation. who are looking for an innovative, precise, and timely method to ingest their data into Snowflake. And where we are seeing a lot of success is a ground up method utilizing both IO Tahoe and Snowflake. To start, you define your as is model by leveraging IO Tahoe to profile your various data sources and push the metadata to Snowflake, meaning we create a data catalog within Snowflake for a centralized location to document items such as source system owners, allowing you to have those key conversations and understand the data's lineage, potential blockers, and what data is readily available for ingestion. Once the data catalog is built, you have a much more dynamic strategy surrounding your Snowflake ingestion. And what's great is that while you're working through those key conversations, IO Tahoe will maintain that metadata push and partnered with Snowflake's ability to version the data, you can easily incorporate potential schema changes along the way, making sure that the information that you're working on stays as current as the systems that you're hoping to integrate with Snowflake. Nice. Uh, Patrick, I wonder if you could address how you how the IO Tahoe platform scales and maybe in what way it provides a competitive advantage for customers. Great question. Where IO Tahoe shines is through its active DQ, or the ability to monitor your data's quality in real time, marking which rows need remediation according to the customized business rules you can set, ensuring that the data quality standards meet the requirements of your organizations. What's great is through our use of RPA, we can scale with an organization. So as you ingest more data sources, we can allocate more robotic workers, meaning the results will continue to be delivered in the same timely fashion you've grown used to. What's more, since IO Tahoe is doing the heavy lifting on monitoring data quality, that frees up your data experts to focus on the more strategic tasks, such as remediations, data augmentations, and analytics developments. Okay, so maybe TG, you could address this. I mean, how does all this automation change the operating model? We were talking to, to AJ and Duncan before about that. I mean, if it involves less people and more automation, what else can I do in parallel? You see, Dave, um, I'm sure the participants today will also be asking the same question. Uh, let me start with the strategic tasks Patrick mentioned. IO Tahoe does the heavy lifting, freeing up data experts to act upon the data events generated by IO Tahoe. Companies that have teams focused on manually building their inventory of the data landscape leads to longer turnaround times in producing actionable insights from their own data assets, thus diminishing the value re realized by traditional methods. However, our operating model involves profiling and remediating at the same time, creating a catalog data estate that can be used by business or IT accordingly. With increased automation and fewer people, our machine learning algorithms augment the data pipeline to tag and capture the data elements into a comprehensive data catalog. As IO Tahoe automatically catalogs the data estate in a centralized view, the data experts can parallelly focus on remediating the data events generated from validating against business rules. We envision that data events coupled with this drillable and searchable view will be a comprehensive one to assess the impact of bad quality data. Let's briefly look at the image on screen. For example, the view indicates that bad quality zip code data impacts the contact data, which in turn impacts other related entities and systems. Now contrast that with a manually maintained spreadsheet that drowns out the main focus of your analysis. TG, how do you tag and capture bad quality data and stop that from, you know, you, you've mentioned these sort of dependencies. How do you stop that from flowing downstream into the processes and, and within the applications or reports? As IO Tahoe builds the data catalog across source systems, we tag the elements that meet the business rule criteria while segregating the failed data examples associated with the elements that fall below a certain threshold. The elements that meet the business rule criteria are tagged to be searchable, thus providing an easy way to identify data elements that may flow through the system. 
The segregated data examples, on the other hand, are used by data experts to triage for the root cause. Based on the root cause, potential outcomes could be, one, changes in the source system to prevent bad data from entering the system in the first place, two, add data pipeline logic to sanitize bad data from being consumed by downstream applications and reports, or just accept the risk of storing bad data and address it when it meets a certain threshold. However, Dave, as for your question about preventing bad quality data from flowing into the system, IOTAHO will not prevent it because the controls of data flowing between systems is managed outside of IOTAHO. Although, IOTAHO will alert and notify the data experts to events that indicate bad data has entered the monitored assets. Also, we have redesigned our product to be modular and extensible. This allows data events generated by IOTAHO to be consumed by any system that wants to control the targets for bad data. Thus, IOTAHO empowers the data experts to control the bad data from flowing into their system. Uh, thank you for that. So, I mean, one of the things that I've, you know, we've noticed, we've written about is that you've got these hyper-specialized roles within the, you know, the data, the centralized data organization. And, and I wonder how do the data folks get involved here, if at all? And, and how frequently do they, do they get involved? Maybe Central Nisman, you can take that. Well, uh, based on whether the data element in question is in data cataloging or monitoring phase, different data folks gets involved. When it is in the data cataloging stage, the data governance team, along with enterprise architecture or IT, involved in setting up the data catalog, which includes identifying the critical data elements, business term identification, definition documentation, data quality rules and data event setup, data domain and business line mapping, lineage, PIA tagging, source of truth, so on and so forth. These are typically in one time setup, review, certify, then govern and monitor. But while when it is in the monitoring phase, during any data incident or data issues, IOTAHU broadcasts data signals to the relevant data folks to act and remediate as quick as possible and alerts the consumption team. It could be the data science, analytics, business ops about the potential issue so that they are aware and take necessary preventive measure. Let me show you an example critical data element from data quality dashboard view to lineage view to data 360 degree view uh, for a zip code for conformity check. So in this case, the zip code did not meet the pass threshold during the technical data quality check and was identified as non-compliant item and notification was sent to the IT folks. So clicking on the zip code will take to the lineage view to visualize the dependent system, such that who produces and who are the consumers. And further drilling down will take us to the a detailed view where a lot of other informations are presented to facilitate for a root cause analysis and you know, to take it to a final closure. Thank you for that. So TJ, Patrick was talking about the as is to the to be. So I'm interested in how it's done now you know, versus before, do you need a data governance operating model, for example? Typically, a company um, that decides to make an inventory of their data assets would start out by manually building a spreadsheet managed by data experts of the company. Uh, what started as a draft now gets baked into the model of the company. This leads um, to loss of collaboration as each department makes a copy of their catalog for their specific needs. This decentralized approach leads to loss of uniformity, which um, each department having different definitions, which ironically needs a governance model uh, for the cat data catalog itself. Um, and as the spreadsheet grows in complexity, the skill level needed to maintain it also increases, thus leading to fewer and fewer people knowing how to maintain it. Above all, the content that took so much time and effort to, to build is not searchable outside of that spreadsheet document. Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head, TG. Now companies want to move away from the spreadsheet approach. Uh, IOTAHO addresses the shortcoming of the traditional approach, enabling companies to achieve more with less. You know, I'm interested in what, what the customer reaction has been. Uh, we had Webster Bank on one of the early episodes, for example. I, I mean, could they have achieved uh, what they did without 
something like active data quality and, and automation, maybe Sentil, Nitin, you could address that. Sure. It is impossible to achieve full data quality monitoring and remediation without automation or digital workers in place. Reality that enterprise, they don't have the time to do the remediation manually because they have to do an analysis, confirm, fix, and any data quality issues as fast as possible before it gets bigger and no exception to Webster. That's why Webster implemented IOTAHU's active DQ to set up their business metadata management and data quality monitoring and remediation in their Snowflake cloud data lake. We helped in building the center of excellence in the data governance, which is managing the data catalog, scheduled on-demand and in-flight data quality checks where Snowflake, Snowpipe and Stream are super beneficial to achieve in-flight quality checks. Then the data exception monitoring and reporting. Last but not the least, the time saver is persisting the non-compliant records for every data quality run within the Snowflake cloud along with remediation script so that during any exceptions, the respective team members is not only alerted but also supplied with necessary scripts and tools to perform remediation right from the IOTAHU's active DQ. Very nice. Okay, guys, thanks for the demo, Gr great stuff. Now, if you want to learn more about the IO Tahoe platform and how you can accelerate your adoption of Snowflake, book some time with a data RPA expert. All you got to do is click on the demo icon on the right of your screen and set a meeting. We appreciate you attending this latest episode of the IO Tahoe data automation series. Look, if you missed any of the content, it's all available on demand. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. Thanks for watching.